Hey, welcome back to another episode of the Good Advice Podcast. Wherever you are in your business, whatever you're doing in your business, you may be wondering what is the secret answer to your business? What's the secret sauce or the best decision you can make to grow your business right now? Well, unfortunately, a lot of times there's really not a lot you can do. A lot of times you have to rely on the right amount of luck and the right amount of timing to do well with your business. Today's show, we have Joshua Ayers on the podcast. It's probably one of the best conversations I've had with someone on business. Joshua ran a startup in the pre-COVID days that was all about delivering groceries straight to your door. It didn't pan out then, but you have to kind of wonder, would it have worked after COVID? Probably. We talk a lot about timing. We talk a lot about luck and all the things that go into making your business successful. Hey, check out this conversation. It's a good one. But before we dive in, let's get a word from one of the amazing businesses that sponsor the show. We'll be right back soon. You know that feeling at 10 o'clock at night when you finished a long day of work and you're trying to figure out all the financials of your business? Well, the good news is you don't have to be an expert in this space. You got to just know who is the expert to call. That person is Steve Lay with Equity Business Solutions, and he does business bookkeeping services better than anyone else I know. By not only helping you manage your books, he can also be the expert to help you understand your books. On top of that, he also handles payroll for businesses and really takes the worry and stress of managing all of these things so that you can focus on running your business well. So what are you waiting for? Stop wasting time trying to understand all these elements of your business. Call Steve Lay at Equity Business Solutions and he'll show you the value beyond the numbers. Go to equitybusinesssolutionsllc.com to find out more. Joshua, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Blake. Yeah, totally. Well, um, just for my listeners, just to give you some perspective on Josh, uh, Joshua and I, we... It's kind of funny. We worked together a little bit in some capacity, really, I guess, a year, maybe two years ago. Yeah, about a year and a half. And um, what ended up happening was, uh, I guess, randomly on LinkedIn, it was like, hey, what are you doing now? And that's what I'm doing. And we were like, okay, let's get some coffee together. And I kid you not, in my mind, I think I anticipated like a 45-minute, maybe an hour conversation. And then after like two hours, I was like, I love this man. (laughs) Like, I can just talk endlessly with this guy. And it was like, man, I got to get you on my uh, podcast channel uh, because you have such an awesome perspective on, I think, especially really where I want to start today is the startup community and and, and what does it look like to build a startup and what does it look like to bounce back from a failed startup, which I don't know if that's too harsh a word to use. No, I'll I'll tell you if I ever do bounce back. (laughs) Years from now, maybe I'll be able to tell the story, but I I can at least tell you where I'm at in the stage of, of, you know, nursing my wounds a little bit. And yeah, uh, but yeah, let's, let's back up a little bit. Uh, Who are you? You know, what do you do? You know, let's, let's clue in the listeners a little bit about yourself. Yeah. So um, I have, my background was supply chain and logistics. So that Mm -hmm. was field of study. And uh, late 1998, I think, is when I kind of got my first exposure to um, living in the retail and consumer packaged goods mecca of Northwest Arkansas. Mm. I went to take an internship with Procter and Gamble, and we were I was calling on Walmart and Sam's, and this is my first experience of actually like taking what I was learning in the classroom and applying it, and actually seeing. Oh, this is actual business. This is what we do. And so it, that was tons of fun. Later, went to work for an ad agency um, that got acquired by Saatchi and Saatchi and became this great thing. And I just saw tons of explosive growth. So I was on a young team, seeing it grow. Then I went back to the supplier side, spent about 10 years working for large brands, Unilever, Kraft Foods, groups like that. Saw tons of great work. And yet one of the things that kept coming was I had this entrepreneurial itch. Um, it it was never, I, this is, this is a funny thing and we can get into it, but you know, what I did know about entrepreneurship was a level of, a level of risk taking, right? 
Mm. And I, I, I was like, well, I'm pretty risk averse. I don't know if this is going to work <laughs> out. So then I had to, you know, kind of put on my marketing hat and put the spin on it, which was, no, I'm, I'm highly pragmatic. That's what it is. Huh. Like, I'm not risk averse. Yeah. So I, what's, what's the difference? What do you mean? I, I'm highly pragmatic, man. I, I go, well, you know, it was never the right time with a wife and kids and, uh, leaving a good salary to just go out on a whim, right? I wanted to be calculated. I wanted to say, I do have this entrepreneurial desire. I want to pursue things, but timing is going to be huge. And so can I, uh, can I take the givens in life and, and approach and take some risk, but do it within maybe some parameters? Uh, if you've, one of the guys I like to follow is Tim Ferriss. Yeah. He did yeah. a TED talk, uh, what, a year or two back on fear casting is what he called it. I thought it was a really helpful exercise, though, of basically calling out what your fears are and then risk mitigation. And that was something that for me was important because I go, I probably tend to be a fearful person, but I also very much wanted to do uh, mm -hmm. entrepreneur things. And I, I think the thing I probably should have highlighted on was working in these big companies, I saw lots that was working well, right? So, I mean, these companies that have built these massive Fortune 100 brands, mm -hmm. huge. And yet, if you and I were starting the company today, no way would we do it like that huh. and we wouldn't do meetings like that and we wouldn't spend all this time in red tape and whatever and so that was the frustration as i sat there i go i'm working for these amazing companies with hundred year old brands and and really good people and yet if if a cluster of us were to go off and start our own thing today it would look so different we do it very differently and so i mm. felt like if that's the case then can i find something that I'm passionate about? Can I find something that I want to throw my time and energy into and get surrounded by some friends and, and try and make something happen? Mm. So, yeah, well, I, you know, and as is, I feel like it's true to all conversations I get into, my head is spinning with like five different things I really want to park on. Um, I love talking about kind of the fear-based mentality because it's been, it's kind of like, you know, when you buy a red car and then suddenly you see that car everywhere, everywhere, right? <laughs> Well, it's been funny because everyone I've been talking to over the last, really the last two or three weeks, I've been talking about this fear-based mentality and how it's just so crippling for what we can eventually do or what our aspirations are, what have you. The other thing, the other thing I'm thinking about is being risk averse, mm -hmm. and um, it actually kind of pairs in with my third thought that I'm thinking of is you, know, you talk about how fortunes, and not to disparage any, there's phenomenal brands yes, locally to Northwest absolutely. Arkansas. But just fortunes in general, uh, I read uh, statistics that that over the la over the next ten years, fortunes will drop off of the list mm -hmm. at a faster rate than ever before in history. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. And so, you typically in the past you had these companies that would be on the fortunes on the Fortune 500 or uh, the Standard and Poors, and and they would be on that list for you know decades right. at a time. Right and now, part of this because the world is so innovative now, but also it's I think it's because. Um, there's so much needless complexity mm -hmm. and you even mentioned like if we were going to go do this same thing, we'd do it totally different. Yeah. And I feel like the clunkiness of large business sometimes yeah. makes it difficult to be innovative and to adapt and to totally. be a successful business. Absolutely. I, I had a boss named Rich Cly and uh, he made this point to us one day and I remember it just sticking in my head so much was he said it used to be that the big fish ate the small fish. He said, now it is the fast fish eats the slow fish. And I, it, it took me a minute, but then he began to expound upon it. And I saw it then for the next 10 years was, so as you're talking about these groups that had been on fortunes for decades and now are mm. beginning to fall off, it's the yeah. groups that are ready to adapt quickly right. that can come in and steal market share. I'll give you an example. Right. I worked for a large company. We had a huge market share, let's say in snacks and cookies and crackers as an example, just randomly. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember seeing this opportunity where I would go into a Sam's Club and there was a brand that had a gluten-free cracker offering. And here we were, this company with massive, massive reach, uh -huh. probably, you know, huge share in the market. We yeah. had zero gluten-free offerings. Wow. So I'm sitting there talking to one of the sales managers. I go, hey, my wife... Uh, has a gluten intolerance. She's not celiac. She's not, you know, going to mm -hmm. keel over. But hey, she doesn't even go down your aisle. Mm. You don't have a single offering. Yeah. Can, can't we come up? Surely, like with our manufacturing and hundreds of years, like surely we can come up with 
some gluten-free thing that tastes decent, right? right? And the thought there is what would get shut down in these big companies is, uh, you know, we'll, we'll introduce this item here and it'll sell X number of units per store per week. And since the threshold in our category is here and it'll only sell here, it'll get discontinued after a year or whatever. Now, that's the mindset of thinking that they would have. And so they'd shoot down ideas, shoot down ideas. And yet I was sitting there going, somebody's going to come with a gluten-free cracker, cookie, et cetera. Mm -hmm. The thing about it is, is it may be the 40th best seller on the list, but it is 100% incremental. Because right now you capture zero sales from mm -hmm. my wife and people with gluten intolerance. Yeah. So even if it's not going to do the volume that an Oreo, a Ritz, a Triscuit or whatever, it's completely incremental. So go out and do it. And so the companies that are ready to be nimble, ready to respond to trends, ready to respond to consumer research go, well, shoot, we can enter the market and they start stealing share. And that's where that fast fish comes in and starts yeah. stealing share. Well, I, you know, and, and also to the listeners, let me apologize. We're, we're recording at uh, one of my favorite spots. Uh, hopefully they send me a bill for or an invoice <laughs> for sponsoring them. Uh, we're at Puritan uh, coffee house over off of, uh, I guess uptown across from the Malco Theater. And so you might hear some ambient noise. Uh, I'm going for that NPR effect. You know, whenever they right. interview, there's always that great ambient Terry sound. Gross. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Well, so, okay. So I love what you're saying. It, like I'm, I'm just, I'm really pinging off it because I was talking to someone the other day and they were like, you know, they said something like, well, you know, it's a young man's game. And I was like, okay, that's mildly sexist. So I don't know if you could say that, but I, I started thinking about it and I go, okay, really it's, it's, a small businesses game, mm. meaning mm. it's it's just like you said, typically kind of the stereotype of business is that you have, there's no way these small businesses can compete with the larger brands. But we've seen that, especially in the last 10 years, it's no longer the case. I think Uber is the perfect sure. example, came out of nowhere, launched three times, like the first two just totally flopped. So they had to launch three times and now have such an incredible, uh, I think their, their valuation is over a hundred oh, billion dollars. And it's like, this was a known in company, right? Right. And so, and I think part of this, because kind of what you're pointing out, you have these companies that are so slow mm -hmm. and not, not all large companies, right. but they're so slow and clunky and it's hard to make, you know, I don't, I don't know what it is. I, I, thinking about that meeting, for example, like you're looking at all the products you sell or where yep. you can, where you can steal some market share. Right. Is it, is it a lack of critical thinking? Is it that their people aren't empowered to make those kind of decisions? Yep. Is it... Is it, I can't think long-term or strategically? I mean, I think it's a combination of things. So one thing that I see happening, and this has happened that I saw within the, the companies I worked for, but then as a consultant, I really saw when I started visiting a lot of companies. And that's this. You do have silos, right? And for a reason. Marketing sits separately from sales, which sits separately from finance, which sits separately from supply chain. I get it. And there's reason and rationale and everybody has their own goals. But what happens is you come into an organization and you start realizing your goal might be in competition to, but is certainly, uh, it may not be completely adverse to another goal in the organization, but they're certainly in competition. So, so it's say for example, sales, it's the end of the quarter. And we rush it in and we get the buyer to take a big sale and everybody pats themselves on the back. And now you've completely hosed your logistics team because there's a driver shortage. Trucks aren't available. The distribution centers, all their slots are available. So now you're paying fees for shipping in less than truckload instead of truckload. You're paying fees for dock does that time. Mean, does that mean when the truck's not totally full? That's or, right, right. Okay. You're, or yeah. you're just, uh, so you, you get all these fees added on to something. So you, you pat yourself on the back for here, but you've sub-optimized over here. So that's one yeah. issue. Okay, yeah. The other that you talked about it, that, that was occurring to me was we have each of those different functions. When there are silos, we have to justify our own existence, right? And so huh. some of it becomes territorial. We have to run this by the marketing director and get their rubber stamp mm. or else why do we have a marketing director? Yeah. And if they don't get their fingerprints on it. So, for example, won't say the company, but I had a company I was working for. The buyer said, hey, I want to do this in my stores. And, our, of course, our sales director said, heck, yeah, we want to do that. But what it was was combining two different of our brands onto a same display vehicle. And our own brands shot it down and said, 
well, we've got a different value proposition. We what? And we're going, what the heck? We're under the same umbrella, like the same PL, the same whatever. Yeah. But because our brand represents this for millennials and our brand represents <laughs> this for whatever, and we're going, what other what other $30 million opportunities are you all shooting down this year that you're just not yeah. gonna? I mean, just that type of thing where people are siloed, they've got to justify their existence. And so sometimes it just becomes the mechanism of as companies get so large. They lose that agility and that ability to just respond to yeah. what the customer is asking for, or or the ultimate end consumer. Well, and it's it's I'm hearing a lot of ego. First of all, it's an ego problem. Well, it's, I do have that. That's <laughs> a lot of ego from you. That's right. I just want to take a moment and address your massive ego for a second. Yeah, yeah I think it's appropriate. <laughs> no, but it feels like it feels like ego is a massive deterrent, and that people are, like you said, they're they're legitimizing their existence, and especially I would assume as you climb the corporate ladder. Uh, here, here's a great way I, I would put it. I, I really appreciated Donnie Smith, who's the former yeah. CEO of Tyson. Tyson. Yeah. Love his philosophy on leadership. Uh, I think the revenue of Tyson went from something like $7 billion to $80 billion in the five years that he was CEO. That's, I mean, that's, that's good, yeah. good return. <laughs> and he was talking about how one of the biggest deterrents that he had to root out was people who, as they moved up the company, they would say once they landed that big executive title – they would buy a lake house or they would buy a boat. Mm -hmm. And so when, once you get onto the conversation of your existence or like, why do you matter here? Right. What's forefront is, well, I, I bought a boat and I'm always going to have a boat because not having that boat <laughs> is like downgrading. That's right. It's like downgrading That's right. in life. And yeah. so I will do whatever I can to protect my status, you know, and the status symbol of this boat. Right. Uh, even, even to the point of detriment for this company. And I love the word you used of agility because I think that's really, that's, mm -hmm. that's really what it is. It's they're too slow to adapt yep. and either they get, they get, uh, beat out by market share, uh, or they just get totally left behind. Yeah. And it's like, what happened to that brand? Right. Like, how did, I mean, Blockbuster, where did that Whoa. brand go? Yeah. Kodak, where did that? Circuit bring? City. Yeah. Things that had made, and that's always something, right? Jim Collins, good to great. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Circuit City was listed in there and like yeah. shows you how quickly the times change that even yeah. a company of that caliber, gone. Yeah. Done. Yeah, it's kind of scary a little bit. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. Which dovetails a little bit back into why I wanted to do something for myself, right? Was this, this A, there was ego on my part too, which was, I, I think Blake and I could do a better job of that or or you know whatever it was i saw terrible customer service everywhere mm. and this isn't picking on say the customer the brands i work for i'm yeah. saying at my home we're moving to a house and hey there's a pool and we need a pool cover and my wife called four places in town no one picked up the phone and only one place called back that's my pet peeve man so it was like 3500 dollars for a pool cover well guess who got the business the one freaking group that yeah. even bothered to return a phone call like yeah. we're throwing money and opportunity at you and it was over and over and we we chatted before the the recording started on that seinfeld episode where he, <laughs> he is trying to get a car reservation yeah what what do you mean you don't have a car i have a reservation we i remember this is where it the crescendo for me on going pulling out what little hair I had left on my head <laughs> and wanting to start my own thing. I'm, I'm with my big company and we're flying to New Jersey. And in one day or one eight hour period or so, I saw such poor customer service across so many industries that I said, I, I, we've got to, I've got to do something different. So here's what happened. We're uh, on a major airline. Pick your, airline because we probably all had bad experiences on one of them or another. Pretty much right? any of them would apply. There you go. Story, That's right. Sure. So I show up to the airport and then once you get there and once you check in and then it's, oh, by the way, this is delayed for X number of hours. Hey, we've had cell phones for years now. You you, you could have sent a message like <laughs> stay at work, yeah. get some things done, yeah. go see your kid. We're not leaving for hours, right? So that right. was the first thing. Then once we get on the plane, we pull off under the tarmac and we sit. For a long time. Oh, hey, we're just like, you know, this is uh, to get us, get us in the queue. And oh, my gosh. So now you're sitting. But mm. but we can't bring you drinks. And yeah. Stay off your Wi-Fi and your fan's not going to work. The AC's off, yeah. But, but <laughs> we're going to be parked here for you're an hour and a half. That. Yeah. Okay. So now we show up at the airport and it's late at night and it's New Jersey. But we're running super late because everything's been delayed. Uh -huh. We pull up to the jet bridge. 
there's nobody working the jet bridge. And so even though we're 30 feet away, we sit for 45 minutes because there's no one on the other end to extend the jet bridge. And I'm going, hey, we've all seen the little manuals. Like pull that chute and we'll go down the little floaty ramp and get on with our night. So we wait. Then we go from there down to the car rental place. Hey, again, pick, take your pick. A major car rental place. And we go down and we experience the Seinfeld thing. Hey, here's our car. Ah, oh, yeah. We don't have that. What do you mean you don't have it? We've had, we're, we're members. We've had this reserved for however long. Finally get our car. Drive to the hotel where myself and three colleagues were going to be staying. And by this point, it's late at night and we're tired and oh, we're yeah. frustrated. And the poor attendant working the front desk at a known hotel chain says, how, how many of you are there? And at this point, my boss, very mild-mannered man, looked like he was about to lose it. And he said, four of us, all with separate rooms. <laughs> and they go, yeah, we didn't think you all were coming because it's so late past checkout. So we gave some rooms. And it, he's, wow. he's about to hurt this poor person across yeah. the table. So I immediately look at my buddy, Chris. I said, Chris and I will share a room. Don't worry. You know, whatever. And he's like, are you sure? Well, yep, yep, we got it. So the moment Chris and I get on the elevator, I look at him and say, dude, I snore like a freight train. I'm sorry, bro, <laughs> but I didn't want I didn't want Scott to kill anybody. So, yeah. uh, And it was at that moment that I go, great airline or well-known airline, yeah. well-known car rental, well-known hotel chain, and customer service is abysmal. Surely, yeah. surely people who are willing to put in some work yeah. could do better than this uh, in something. And that was, for me, one of the final moments of like, I've, I've got to do something on my own, at least – try what's the difference do you think between you know because i i think about these big national brands and i have certain ones that i will never do business with because of one because of one experience right. um and i you know it takes everything in me not to just like shame and blame <laughs> those brands right, right now but but literally my wife and i know there's certain brands it's like hey you want to go to this place and i'm like oh i don't do business there and I, I stick to it. Yeah. And I think I've, I've thought it through and I wonder, you know, what, what's the, the differentiator between a Chick-fil-A mm -hmm. and a fill in the blank? Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. Cause it's, cause they're both ma right. massive brands, right? I mean, Southwest Airlines, that's right. a massive brand sure. compared to any other any one. Other. And so I, I, you know, Kansas has Quick Trip, uh, Texas has Bucky's. I mean, you have these, these brands that are just as large right. and yet, it's it's like there's this massive gap, and I can't figure out. I mean, we could we could broad brush it and say, oh, it's leadership, right. but like, but what is it though? Right. I mean, what do you think? So I think some of it is culture and the ability to replicate it, right? So do you ever see the the founder with uh, Michael Keaton a few years ago? Basically, it was the story of the McDonald's franchise. And I had maybe heard a little bit about it, but I really didn't know the story. So Michael Keaton is this guy, and he's selling milkshake machines and peddling things around, just eking out a sales thing. And he goes and visits this group called McDonald's, who he calls up trying to sell them a single milkshake machine. And they're like, we'll take eight of them or, you know, something like that. He's like, what the heck? I got to go see this operation. So yeah. he goes out to California. I think it's near the San Bernardino area, but I'm not sure yeah, okay. where it started. Anyway, finds these two brothers who have this, machine of a of a group they're it's not that their their burgers are good their fries are good their shakes are good but it wasn't life-changing but but they they just ran and they had customers out the door and he said oh my gosh so when he talks to them hey why don't you franchise why don't you do this they're basically their response was we realized we cannot replicate us we tried once we hired somebody everything went to pot like it, they didn't carry the ethos with them, right? And so I think in the same way, Chick Fil A, I you know if you hear about it, their their uh, uh, fees. I mean, it's something like seven to ten grand for a franchise fee, like incredibly low. But you've got a seven year wait list, right? And the vetting process to say, right, is this person going to toe the line on what we want the Chick Fil A brand to be? And if they are, yeah. we'll make it a super low barrier to entry, seven to ten grand. But you are absolutely going to carry this torch the way we ask. And so I think I think that's a big part of it is how fast can you replicate? I remember Walmart years ago had all the capital in the world. They were opening uh, five hundred stores a year. I mean, just crazy growth. But their their leadership was telling the market our biggest constraint right now 
is people. Mm. We have the capital to open up a 200,000 square foot place all the time. Can we train up leaders who you can entrust a 200,000 square foot facility to? Well, that that is a harder constraint. And can you propagate that culture and carry that on? So it, that's at least part of what I look at as I go, man, that has got to be a part of it is replicating culture and the time it takes to develop leaders who will buy in and really live that yeah. out. Well, it's kind of a funny conversation to me because I, I think maybe the stereotype a decade ago was like all of this culture stuff is fluffy stuff. It's like feel good stuff. But now you see people like Gary V yeah. or who's just so all in on the concept, which I love because I, I totally agree with it. I'm yeah. like, yeah, totally. Because you see, and I, I put out an article on LinkedIn the other day that talked about, you know, you, you can have, you can spend hours, days, weeks, months on any kind of external strategy. But if you're not developing your people internally, if you're not actually investing mm-hmm. in those people, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, I mean, it doesn't, and that's, I think that's one of the things that people love about Chick-fil-A is you go into a store, you're greeted with a smile, right. you're greeted with, and it's consistently this, this sort of standard of, I know how I'm going to be treated here by the people who, um, it's kind of like, you, I noticed, and it's funny how they kind of innovate the fast food model because, you know, you had the drive through and then you right. go to Chick-fil-A and you start noticing that people are, they're coming to your, your oh, car yes. door. Yes. And it's almost like, you know, personal space. It's like, whoa, hey, you're at my window. That's right. But even like in the rain, even in the cold, yes. you know, and so I always, you know, because I would do a lot in culture, I, I kind of want to see peek behind the curtain. And so we'll be pulling, my wife and I will be pulling through the drive through and I'll say, I'll say something just to see what they say. I'll be sure. like, man, it, it's such a bum. You got to be out here, man. Just to kind of see, you, you know, see, right. you know yeah, it's, I'm not like trying to bait and them. And what kind of response do you get? Oh my gosh, smiles. Oh man, we love it. Man, we take shifts. Man, we're good. Yeah. You know, oh man, they take care of us. I've, I've literally, I ask every time and I've never gotten That's one awesome. negative response. That's so cool. And I mean, you know, I, I, I feel like I can build a, a somewhat of a rapport where someone would be like, oh yeah, tell me about it. Right. And they never do. They never do. Yeah. And it's so... But you, you raise a great point. I mean, if you're going to, if any business is going to grow and scale in any way, mm-hmm. you know, either you clone yourself mm-hmm. or you find people that you can replicate your vision into. That's right. Right. Otherwise, it's not, you get these big brands that suddenly are built kind of like on this house of cards because right. they haven't invested in their people. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. You bring up Chick-fil-A, right? And um, my son just turned 15 about a month ago. And so this is the first summer where he's looking to work, right? And we were in Chick-fil-A's line uh, like a week ago. And sure enough, that same thing. People are coming up with a what looks like an iPad and a credit card right there. And then somebody else is standing under a tent and they're handing you a receipt. And it is a well-oiled machine and pleases and thank yous and happy to serve you. And as my son has looked around, it's a lot more attractive to him to go to work for a Chick-fil-A than fill in the blank, even though I, yeah. I am a frequenter of many fast food <laughs> establishments. Uh, We're not judging, man. It, no. Not I, to your face. Well, and I'll tell you what, I've been known to uh, run for the border on a number of occasions, yeah. <laughs> but that is, here's a perfect example. Where I live at in Little Rock, I have been to multiple, we'll just say it, Taco Bells, uh, within the same city limits, within, could be the same franchise owner, I would think, if it, I don't know. And radically different service. And it's interesting, right? So my daughter and I, and we'll point this out. I always try and give my kids like economics lessons like during it, right? Which is put out a good product, put out a good service, and people will come back. And so you'll have one line that's five, six cars deep, and you show up and you order, and it's like they're handing it to you while you're still doing I mean, it is it's like in real time, my gordita came through the window when I said it, like, wow, this is amazing. And then I go across town to another one. And there's two cars in line, and 15 minutes later, you're going, my goodness, it's a soft taco. Like, yeah. what's going on? And so yeah. my daughter and I will talk, and we'll go, what do you see going on here? And clearly, management's important, right? So we talk about leadership, and that's really important. And sometimes I think management gets a, not a bad rap, but kind of like, you know, leaders are really what you need, and then management's kind of this thing that has to be done. I'm like, no, like. Just ask anybody who's had a bad manager and they'll tell you how important it is to have good management. So sometimes you can have the right culture, the right product, but it really is the people. Can you get them to replicate and do what you said? And that proves to be more difficult. So how, how do you do that? What do you think? You mentioned Gary Vee as well. I saw something, you know, he's got a zillion little 
two minute clips out there of things that people post. And I think, I think he has a lot of good insights. Uh, one of the things he said recently that I saw was the importance of firing, right? Like if you yeah. really want to be hold to a culture, firing in his mind is probably more important than the hiring process. Like you bring people in, but he, here's a high performer. But if that person is cancerous, I don't care if you're a high performer, set the tone that they're out of here because that cancer will spread. And he said, that then sets the tone for everybody. Oh, crap. If that high performer's out the door because they treated people like garbage, then we've got to toe the line. And so I think there is something there. Obviously, I do think hiring is important. I think uh, culture fit. And I think this is something you and I, some of the work we did together some time ago was around identifying how, you know, what's your makeup? What's your, call it Myers-Briggs, you know, call it 360 feedback, any number of these Herman brain dominance, you know, all kinds of things out there. So on paper, you can match well with a company, but you still have to have a a good fit internally. Right. And I think that is pretty big too. Yeah. And I, it feels like a lot of companies don't even know, like, what is the DNA of their own company. Mm -hmm. you, know, you start asking questions like, what's your makeup? Or what, what are your values? And it's like, uh, I don't know. We sell paper here. <laughs> you know, and it's like, okay, well, that's, you got one thing down. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I think what's, what's also really intriguing to process is, you know, going back to the conversation of firing fast. And this isn't a new concept. And it's mm -hmm. funny to me how sometimes people get really, they get so um, innovation jacked that it's mm -hmm. like, what's the new thing mm -hmm. in business management? And it's like, it, there's, you know, we really have all the info we need. It's just execution, right? And so, like this whole concept of firing fast. You know, Gary Vee's been parroting it lately. Yeah. Uh, Jim Collins talked about it. Sure. Get to great when he said, "Get the wrong people off the, bus. off the bus." I mean, if you're going to take this anywhere, you have to get these people off. And what I've noticed is, especially in the last few weeks, I've been talking to people who they say something like, "Man, I've been working on this employee who's absolutely toxic." And then I say, "Well, how long you've been working on him?" And they say some something astronomical, like a year or 18 months or two years, right? And I think sometimes as, as leaders, we, we have this empathetic approach of, of I want to give this, this person time and space. Right. I want right. to coach them. And it's like, yeah, totally coach right. them, right? Because right. if, they're, if they're a bad employee, it could be your fault, right? But it, it feels like there's this sort of like this, um, this rub against each other, these two these, these two alternate perspectives that oppose one another of be empathetic and coach your employees, right. but be so uh, protective of the mission that you'll protect your culture, mm. even if it means letting someone go. Mm -hmm. And those two things, it feels like they oppose one another. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I I think where where I go with that, at least if I'm coming in as an outside consultant, then I have the freedom or the license to speak into it, I would try and identify this. I try and understand, is the person genuinely a, a pariah and a cancer? And if they are, you do, you need to get them out and you need to do it quick. If you go, no, they're, they're a, they're a good person. It's their performance. That's not good, right? That they're just continually missing deadlines and doing whatever. Then it becomes, okay, you've got a good person, they do yeah. are probably – go ahead. You're, you're speaking to motive. Like sure. you're, you're talking about – you're talking about someone who's well-meaning and intentional yeah. but just isn't doing a good well, job. Yeah, are they, versus, are they – is it a competence issue? Do they need yeah. training in it? Or right. otherwise is – I think part of the job of leadership is to get people into positive feedback loops and say, we like what you do, Blake. We don't think this is great for you. And so it's that assessment piece of going, but we're not throwing you out. We're shifting you over here because when you get into that and now you see Blake starting to come alive, well, my company benefits all the more because Blake's happy when he comes to work and he works hard and he does good in it. But that same Blake sitting over in this role, mm -hmm. not great, right? And so that I think that's part of it is assessment and too quickly um, we, we, we interview and we say, hey, what do you want to do? What, what did you study? What did you – whatever? well, those are all great, obvious questions to ask. But a little ways into a, a career, I think you begin to find out a bit more about where is your actual fit? What mm -hmm. are you actually good at? And then we better get you into that role. And if we don't have that role, maybe you're not the fit for the team or the timing's wrong. You are a fit for the team six months from now or a year yeah, from there. I like that. Why don't, why don't more bosses approach it that way? 
Because it feels like sometimes it's kind of like you leave someone to their own devices mm -hmm. and they're not productive mm -hmm. and they, you know, let's assume they're well-meaning. And so they're, sure. they're spinning their wheels. They're trying to be that person. And, you know, 18 months go by and they get let go and it's kind of blinding, man, I've done so much. And they, it's hard to see that they haven't been productive in the way that their boss wanted. Yeah. Why don't those conversations happen more often? That's a good question. I, I think sometimes they're, and again, you, you do have bosses who aren't afraid to be a bulldog and go <laughs> after, and that can be intimidating, right? So you do have those people, but I, I think sometimes what we do is we, we, we look at the total package, right? And I, I heard uh, author Neil Gaiman articulated this way one time. He said, there are really only about three things that you need to be successful in what, whatever path of career you take. Do good work, get your stuff done on time, and be pleasant to be around. Hmm. If you do those three things, you, you'll, you'll do fine. And quite honestly, you can probably get away with doing two of them. If, you're, hmm. if you are a joy to work for and you do good work, they will let those deadlines slip. If you are a horrible person, but you do amazing work and it's always done on time, generally people keep you around. And if you always do stuff on time and you're a nice guy, they go, eh, he does a C plus work. That's better than average. Mm. Yeah, all right. And so I think sometimes there's this, we let things slide because the cost to replace them, the cost to go out and do another thing, eh, they're getting the job done. Or, eh, it was just a little late. And we make excuses sometimes for people. We don't hold feet to the fire. And quite frankly, some of the time that gets set by the person who's in charge. I've been in organizations where I've come into consulting things and people at a very high level are showing up five, six minutes late to a meeting. Well, what, what is that signal sending? On the one hand, if they're an executive, they need to have the flexibility to do what they think is important. Got it. On the other hand, you're absolutely sending a message to everybody that Showing up on time, not that big a deal, mm -hmm. doing this and that. And, and so, again, you go, sometimes we let people slide on things. Sometimes it's a cultural thing where people just aren't held accountable. So I, I think it's a good question, but that's at least my first take on it is where I've seen the breakdown at times. Well, and I think I, I love that you mentioned like the owner who uh, <laughs> is setting the tone yeah. for, for better or worse. And it it makes me think of there was one company I worked with who – it was like a hundred million dollar company, I mean, massive company. And they had, you know, paid out something like a hundred grand worth of consulting work. And they were trying to get some training done for their employees. And there was this one employee who was just absolutely toxic. I mean, incredibly toxic. And it, he kind of became a project mm -hmm. of, you know, Blake, can you fix this person? Wow. And, and at that point, it's kind of like there, this person has, you know, gone way off the deep end. But also, I think what was really hard was as I began to unpack and pull back the layers, realizing that all of the toxicity that this person had was valid in the mm. sense of it was an outcome from what his owner had, mm. like the tone his owner had yeah. set in the business. Right. right. And so then to go back to the owner and say, hey, you created this. Yeah. You started yeah, that's this. Rough. Yeah. And, I, and, you know, as much of an ego blow as it may be to hear this here are the X, Y, and Z reasons that this person is this way. And naturally, you know, and I don't want to, you know, yep. people have, they, they walk their own path. They, they have to decide if they're going to um, analyze things a certain way. Sure. But, but on the same token, you know, we, especially as bosses, we have a lot of influence right. in right. terms of the direction our people go. Yeah. No. And, and you, you know, when, when you had that, uh, insight that as you peel the, the layers back and you realize, oh, shoot, this is really coming from higher up. That's why this person's like that. I think the the call out to leaders at any level in an organization is, you know, you can say this is our company value, but when all the time we we say, and again, this is this is in government, this is in education, this is in business, private sector, it's we desire behavior A, but we reward behavior B. Right. And I see that all the time. I mean, right. take take something like teaching. Okay, teacher, you're given a hundred dollar budget for this thing. That's your budget. If the teacher comes in at $95 and does what they are supposed to, that should be applauded and patted on the back. But what happens? Well, next year your budget gets cut because you only needed 95. Whereas if you spend 105, which is the wrong behavior, you get 
rewarded with, oh, hey, clearly these, these teachers need bigger budgets, right? So that happens all the time. We desire behavior A, but we reward B. I saw it in companies when it came to um, loyalty. You would think that that's why I love companies and programs, uh, not just loyalty programs, say with an airline or something, but engagement where the longer you stay, the more invested you are, the more perks you get. What drives me crazy is the cable companies where you go, hey, I've been with you for five years, but I got the competitor calling me and offering me 20% less. So I, so I go, okay, I'm switching. And then your own cable company goes, whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, we'll give you that deal. What the crap? Why didn't you give me that deal? I've been with you for five years. Mm -hmm. You're rewarding me to leave. And then I saw it in the business world was you should be rewarded to stay, but you're always more valuable somewhere else. And so if you leave, you get paid more. And then you you go and then your current company says, yeah, 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 we want to keep you. Well, that's not good. Well, and it's kind of like I was, I was, I've referenced this before my podcast, but I was talking to someone the other day who he said he was at a company for six years. And a 1% increase was the norm. So we got 6% over six years. Not even keeping up and with cost of yeah, living. Yeah, right, right, right. Or a, And even beyond just cost of living, uh, healthcare costs sure. alone oh. have increased beyond that every oh, yeah. year. So I was, we were talking about it. And I started thinking about, uh, there was a Forbes article that came out a few years ago. And I'm going to butcher the numbers on it. But it's, it was literally something astronomical like, you are likely to increase your overall salary up to 50% if you change jobs this many times wow. in the next five years. Because every time you change jobs, you can leverage a much higher base salary. Sure. And what I was, when I, sh- I actually had shared it with someone uh, who I really respected at the time, and, I, and I, it makes it sound like I don't anymore. I still do. Right. But I really was curious their perspective. And we were talking about turnover. And I said, you know, we shouldn't, this shouldn't be the case. I mean, we should be competitive with any other company right. they should go, they, they're wanting to go with. Yeah. And it's actually why some of the most successful companies that I think of and that I've personally worked with, it's interesting how there's this theme of massive salary increases, like up to 10% mm-hmm. per year. Wow. And they're not just, they're not just, um, you know, just willy nilly given. Sure. They're tied to performance. Sure. But it's amazing how when people are offered that opportunity, how they'll elevate. Um, I don't know if my right. listeners can hear the crying baby. We're not abusing anyone. It's just <laughs> someone's crying baby in this not, not right coffee now, shop. To, to be yeah. fair. I'm not <laughs> to clarify. Moment, we're not. But it's amazing how people will elevate when they know. It's not like the carrot on the stick. It's just, okay, I have. I know if I do good work, I'm going to be paid accordingly. Yep. And not everyone is assertive in getting what they're right. due. So, so, and I think of it in two things, right? You said the carrot on the stick, right? The opposite is, is the stick to, right. motiv- to motivate, right? Right. And I think that's part of the thing is understanding what is motivating different people. I remember the, uh, uh, story from years ago, um, the Brooklyn, or I'm sorry, I, I took the red bus tour in, in Manhattan the first time I went and, you know, we're going by the Empire State Building and they said, okay, you know, Gosh, now I'm going to miss it. But I think it's 100, 100 stories, I'm pretty sure. They say this was built in 13 months during the Great Depression. 13 months, 100 stories. Why? Didn't matter if you fell off. Didn't matter if you didn't. If you were sick, there's a 50 guys lined up ready to take your job tomorrow. It's the Great Depression. They built that thing like fast. And I'll, I'll bemoan that it takes us six months to a year and a half to add a lane <laughs> on the pavement for a yeah. quarter mile. And I go, what the heck? Yeah. You're literally putting gravel down and putting pavement. How can this take a year and a half, right? right? Well, similarly, so there's a motivator of, oh my gosh, there's supply, right? Supply and demand. There's a su- ton of supply. People are ready to take my job. I better do it. There's the incentive of if you stay and do good work and perform, we're going to pay you. There's a whole other people where it's security that matters. Um, another building illustration was out on the one of the bridges. I think it was the Golden Gate. Um, all these people were dying, right? They're building it and people are falling to their death. And when they installed netting, productivity went through the roof. People were no longer afraid of dying. And when you eliminated that worry for them, oh my gosh, they're so much more productive. And so I think that's part of it is trying to identify in your culture, especially when you're young and your startup is knowing 
individually, Blake, Sarah, Jane, Todd, what are you motivated by? Because it's going to be very different for people based on their state of life. Are they more concerned with reward or security? And and so just having more than one tool in your belt to be able to understand where you're at. And that's why I think it's super important that leaders be regularly, you know, every six months or so making sure they're staying in touch with what their people need and want. Well, that, that word in touch, I think is really powerful because it feels like, and it doesn't just feel this way. I know there's a lot of great data behind this. It feels like there's a lot of owners, leaders, whatever title you want to give, who are disconnected. And, and it's not just disconnected with their people. I remember my old company, there was this awesome graph on, uh, you know, one to 10 rate, how things are here. Yeah. And the owners, you know, did eight, nines and tens and <laughs> the, the frontline people are doing one, twos and threes. And so you have this gap and it's like, what? Right. But also not even that, but even like on a, um, like a product standpoint. And I've, I've always loved, uh, the story of Kodak of they literally had the digital technology developed mm-hmm. and the owners or the executive staff said, no, people, they love the feeling of, you know, <laughs> click, the, yeah. clicking the camera and the snapshot comes out and you get to, you know, it has that very, I can hear it in my mind, yeah. like the paper whipping in the air right. as you are, you know, fanning it and as it's developing and people love that too much. You know, they'll never go digital. And now we kind of look at Kodak and laugh and say like, what were y'all thinking? I so blew it. Right. these are really smart people, obviously, yeah. Yeah. and they're obviously very intelligent. Why is there such a gap of disconnection? Yeah. That's a good question. The the thing that comes to my mind, at least, especially when you talk about the leaders in a company rating at eight, nines, tens, and the frontline people are the ones, twos, threes. Part of that, say what you will for Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but I do think there is something there, which is once you've gone further up the ladder and getting closer to self-actualization, there really is something to going, well, yeah. You're a leader. You have people working for you. You don't have people breathing down your neck as much. You're making X amount of salary. Yeah. If you do have a dental appointment and you want to go to it or your kid's soccer game, no one's going to give you flack for it like you go. Whereas down the line, I had to get to my kid's gate. Well, you really need to get this report done. And there becomes this. So I think that's part of it is the higher up people are going, they are getting more self-actualized. They are getting more things. And, you know, life's. Life's good. This is what I want. Yeah. And and just for the listeners, if you're not familiar with, I love that you referenced this, Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. You need to look it up. It's a pyramid. And basically the concept behind it is to, to, to go up the pyramid, which at the very top is self-actualization. I mean, you're, you're living out your calling, you're, you're uh, being autonomous, you're, you're living a fulfilled life, basically. To get to that point, you have to meet the levels that are below that. And the very first level is uh, physical basic needs. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's exactly. It's, you know, do I have food? Do I have shelter? Am I physically safe? And am I emotionally safe? And it makes me think of, uh, <laughs> I love that we have all these companies. It's like, we can't say the name of that company, yeah, That's right. but it makes me think of one company that was <laughs> a, a truck service and the driver, the, I guess the seat had rotted out in the mm. driver's seat. Mm. So they had pulled the seat out, didn't replace it. And they put a fold out chair, no, like an actual fold out chair, and the driver was expected to sit in this fold out chair and drive drive the truck. And it's and so it's like, how do you expect this person to operate on this insane hundred and ten percent level of that's my best most engaged employee when they don't even have their basic basic needs, needs met? That's right. You know, I don't. I'm not allowed to go to my kid's soccer game or yeah. you know all these things that. We need to hit that level. Right. There, there's a, a Chinese proverb, and so saying it in English is probably butchering it, but I, I don't speak Mandarin, so I'm just going to go with the English, which is basically no food, one problem. Lots of food, many problems, right? When when sustenance, when sustenance living and that basic level on Maslow's hierarchy, your basic needs, when you don't have food, you only have one problem in the whole world, mm-hmm. and that is to find food and survive tonight and life it's hard, but it's super clear mm. when you have an abundance of food and options and all kinds of things. Yeah, it's like you heard about, I, I think it was even Obama had uh, basically two jackets, two ties, two color shirts. Like he just said, gosh, this guy's got the weight of the world on him. 
I'm not going to sweat over what I'm going to wear today. Like I'm going to pick a couple of things and make it work. Right. And, but when we are inundated with options and choices and where do you want to eat and how much do you want to spend and how much time have you got and blah, 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 many problems. And mm. we get inundated with this. And, uh, anyway, so I, I find that's really interesting too, is that life can be so much more clear, uh, the lower down, but that doesn't mean it's, it's easy, but choices become simpler. Well, and I'm, I'm a big fan of simplicity. I was actually just earlier today, I was meeting with a guy who he does, he handles the F, the Amazon, uh, fulfillment by Amazon service with his company. Okay. And he's, he took it from $0. They are over, they, ju they just hit $2 million. Wow. So this guy is good at it. Yeah, he's been in the field true. for about 10 years and we were just having coffee and I said, you know, what's, what's the secret? And he said, honestly, just simplicity. Hmm. He said, people make it so complicated. And if you can boil things down to, it actually makes me think of going back to Donnie Smith. He talks about, you know, one of the biggest shifts in the company was, you know, you have this massive fortune 500 company and they have, they have more data than you know what to do with. Sure. I mean, they have, they have data on data on data. Yeah. You have data about the data, yeah. right? And it's, it's, it's software that's thousands and thousands of dollars. And so that. The executive team, they're all sitting in a room and they're pouring over these Excel spreadsheets and looking at this data. And finally, Donnie, you know, looks at it, looks up at the, at the team and everyone's kind of like, you know, at, at the George Costanza, like trying to look really right. into it, busy face. And he kind of just throws it on the ground and says, does anyone understand any of this? And everyone's kind of like, no, we don't get any of this. And he's like, let's get back to like the simple basics of how we do business. Yeah. And he talks about that being a, a major step for how they pivoted because Tyson actually at one point was, as he described it, 21 days from bankruptcy. Wow. Yeah. I don't Before he I took on the CEO Sheesh. role, 21 days from bankruptcy Sheesh. back in uh, after the crash uh, in 2009, around that time, oh. 21 days away. And one of the big pivots was we have to get back to simplicity. Sheesh. That That's is it. that is very good. And, and I, I like companies like Chipotle where... Yes, they did food well, but one of the things that I think was a key to some of their success was a simple menu, right? Mm -hmm. Like you don't have a zillion things. You go, you want it in a shell, on lettuce, or in a wrap? Right. Yeah. You want pork or chicken or beef, right? Like it's pretty, pretty simple. There weren't a zillion things and therefore, okay, I know what I'm getting and, and I, we keep it clean. So now you've got less variability in in your food supply you've got less variability in terms of you know just making things simple and people have built some really good business models well, off doing a few things really well yeah and it's funny how i've i've binged on too many hours of gordon ramsay on yeah. kitchen nightmares yeah. on youtube yeah. and it's i i just love the episodes where he goes in and he's sitting in the restaurant that's failing and they have like <laughs> a 10 page menu with like 150 items and he's like what is wrong with you people but, you know, even Chipotle, even with all their simplicity, their their culture broke down. Yeah. I mean, they had the massive, uh, I almost said Ebola. That's not Salmonella right. Pulls <laughs> Salmonella. Salmonella. Yeah. Not, right. not once, but twice. Yeah. And so, it, again, it goes back to, you know, you have to have the right people that you invest in. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, even the most simplistic, perfect business model right. is going to break down. Yeah. Yeah. So, let's let's do this. I want to I wanna pivot a little bit. Sure. I, I We're talking a lot about business. I really want to talk about the startup world. Okay. Uh, I had a guy on the podcast uh, a couple weeks ago who is, he's doing a startup in the cryptocurrency space. Yeah. And I've been really intrigued by startups in general because it feels like we have like these certain principles of how we do business that's like appropriate. Mm. And yet in the startup world, it's like, it's like, ah, eh, we're a startup. Mm. And, and here's an example of this. It's, I was talking to one guy who, one owner who was explaining to me, he was panicked. Mm -hmm. He had a staff of 15 people. Mm -hmm. And he said, I haven't paid my people in six weeks. And I'm worried they're going to quit. Yeah, I think that's a little bit <laughs> worrying. Uh, and he, he was like, how, how can I keep them? And I was like, what are you doing, man? Paying them? Yeah, you know, it's that's like, a good, good it's a good, <laughs> yeah, hey, you're crazy. Uh, I don't know where you're coming from. You know, and I, but I, I see themes like that a lot. And it's, it's kind of like, it's like the, the the seven deadly sins of startups mm -hmm. and it's it's almost like we're in a separate category so we're going to fly by the seat of our pants in terms of things that are acceptable just for like pure business sense mm -hmm. uh, w what's your take on that i i think sometimes there's a, a nugget of truth or a learning that comes from that and so you have uh things like that 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 become a little I don't know, clickish and cool and whatever, but is it good business sense? I, I, I'm inclined to 
stick to what we know works and is proven, right? So uh, I don't want to, you know, fail fast. Well, do the fast part. I agree with fails not great though, <laughs> right? But I get I get the mentality yeah. behind that is if you're going to fail, like learn it quickly. Don't take six months to do an A B testing. Like do that A B testing in four weeks and move yeah. on. Um, or two years for an MVP. That's right. Or yeah. or an, a, an item being introduced to a store. They'll do a test to do a test. Like, oh, well, we'll do these 50 stores in order to see if you get a 600 store test. Well, no, like, if it performs, then let's roll it out. Let's not do a test to test to do, you know, sometimes it just gets too cumbersome, which gets back to agility and what we talked about earlier. I think one of the things in startup, um, people need to be, so, so two things that I think you have to hold in tension. One is, here's my idea that I, that I, think is good. I think it's good enough that I'm putting my time, my energy, some capital towards it, et cetera. The other thing that you hear a lot about is pivoting. Pivoting is very important. And we hear tons of great examples of that. You need to be able to hold this intention though of, you know, you, you hear the story of the guy who had the idea and he got shot down by 50 venture capital groups. Well, on that 51st one, found the person who backed him and proved, yo, no, this really was a great idea. And then there are other people who go, I don't have, I don't have the time, the runway, the capital to go through 50 people like, and so if I see a pivot early on that says my idea, yeah, part of it was okay. I, I like the IP from this. Let's run with that. Okay. So how do you remain agile? How do you remain nimble? I think part of it is be committed to your idea that that brought you to the game and gave you the passion to stick your neck out but don't be so committed to it that you're just holding on and not willing to hear what the market is telling you markets are very good at telling you mm. if they're interested in your product or not or your service yeah and it's 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 i love what you just said because it's it's almost like we make it too hard and and i i don't want to oversimplify it but it's kind of like i was talking to a guy uh who reached out to me the other day and he said, Hey, I want some advice on, is this a good, uh, is this a good product idea? And he basically he ended the question with, would you buy this? And I said, well, am I, am I your target market? He's like, well, no. <laughs> I go, so <laughs> I go, so it doesn't matter if I would buy it. Right. He's like, yeah, yeah. But I want to know if it's a good idea. And I was like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what right. I think, you know, it's, yeah. it's, you have to actually ask the people who, you would want to actually buy your products. That's right. Right? But That's we right. overcomplicate it sometimes, it feels like. Yeah. When I was running this uh, pilot program a number of years back on this last mile delivery, we pretty quickly validated a couple things that, that again, gave me a lot of hope, which was uh, I, I actually won a couple of pitch contests. One of the pitch contests I won was kind of the, the People's Choice Award, if you will, whereas there's judges, but it was the people voted instead of all the ideas we heard tonight. It resonated with more people, right? What year is this? Uh, this is 14, 15 cool. time okay. frame. Yeah. Uh, I started working on it technically around November, December of 13. Spent 14 doing a lot of research and fact gathering. And then by 15, I was when I finally started running my pilot, trying to get a CTO on board, all that. But, but when I won the second pitch contest, it was the judges, uh, like actual business people who – have run businesses and go, no, that that's solid. There's like, I got there. something. Here. Right. So yeah. cool. the okay. people want it. Yeah. And actual business people go, oh, no, you're onto something. And so I had this tremendous shot in the arm. But when we ran the pilot test, we very quickly saw where some of our pain points were. We we saw where that friction was in a good customer experience. And what drove me crazy was I felt like I could go to investors now and say, look, we've got people saying we want this. We've got business people saying that's solid. I've run a pro forma and met with, you know, financial planners. I've talked to attorneys. I've talked to insurance. Like you've done your due diligence and what you've been told in the startup world is you just need a minimum viable product. People out in Silicon Valley are getting millions of dollars for a, you know, you hear that kind of stuff. So you go, okay, I've got some and I've done a lot more validation than these guys. So you run your, your MVP and then you get told, well, you're, your minimum viable product is too minimal or it's not viable enough or something. And so even though and I guess I'm a agreeing with you that getting back to the basics, doing what works is fundamental. And yet sometimes even then the challenges, at least in some markets to get something off the ground feels 
a lot more than just doing that. And that's the, I think the frustration I ran into as an entrepreneur was I thought I was, I thought I was trying to keep it simple. I thought I was trying to make it whatever. And you come to find out there's still uh, a significant amount of work and hurdles to overcome. Well, and it's, I think it's, I think it's always a challenge to be mindful and self-aware enough to recognize, cause you know, it's like you said, it's like, I'm, as I see it, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing. Like, why is this still not clicking? And I think, I, I, I think part of the blame is, you know, this is very prevalent in like digital media, but I have kind of like this war on um, the sexiness of entrepreneurship <laughs> and that we have all of these terms that people, it's like we word vomit it mm-hmm. like back to each mm-hmm. other. And it's like, yeah, just get your MVP going right. or, or, you know, the one that I'm really, and you know, as much as I like Gary Vee, he's the biggest, he's the biggest problem in this area of what I call hustle culture. Right. You, know, you just got to hustle, right. you know, you just got to be hustling. And it's, 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 it, it, people are using this terminology without even really knowing what it means. Yeah. And I think it's a detriment to the entrepreneurship and startup world where mm-hmm. it's like, you know, whenever we talk about execution of these ideas, it is much harder and much more complicated than yes. we realize. Yes. Uh, I've got a friend and somebody I look to for, for advice and counsel on things, a guy named Henry Ho. And Henry had told me when I was beginning to go down this path, as well as he's reiterated other times, he says, everything always takes longer than you think. It's going to be more expensive than you think. That's right. And, yep. so, and so on. But again, oh, well, shoot, I ought to be able to. They ought to be able to code this in no time. Yeah. We ought to be able to run that test in no time. Always takes longer, mm-hmm. always more expensive than you think, et cetera. And yeah. just, okay, can I, can I? Well, and it feels like, this is like the small silver lining I have for myself in that, you know, you, you know the odds are stacked against you and some ridiculous number of businesses are going to fail, right. not just in the first year, but especially by the five-year sure. mark and especially by the 10-year mark. And so part of that, you know, the way I can internalize that is like, well, yikes, I'm screwed. Right. Uh, or it can be, okay, I, there's a lot of people out there who the way they operate is not grounded in reality. Mm. And it, it almost inflates that number. And a good example mm. of this would be like, I talked to a guy who said, I have this really great business idea. And I said, well, what is it? And he says, it's Facebook, but better. <laughs> Love it. And I had someone Go else who said, "Go for it." But- yeah, someone else who said another idea. It's Amazon, but better. And I, Ship is sailed, you friend. know, and it's like, yeah. it's like you're totally not rooted in reality. And actually, I was working with some people this morning and it was basically a, a startup uh, pitch competition is what it was. And the common thread, and they had worked out their business model. They had worked out their cost. They knew down to the dollar, this is how much it's going to cost. But the, the one qualifier of now, how will you pay for this? Every single one of them, the common thread, the answer for all of them was, oh, we'll just get VC funding. <laughs> Which is oh, easy. Yeah. They're just lined up out the yeah, door. Yeah, or, or, or we'll just get a grant. And then they, they would just blaze over that detail. And I'm kind of like, hold on, wow. guys. If it's not like a button you press, like, oh, let me get, yeah, I'll just get funding. Just take a VC, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That, like that's, that is the sole reason why the majority of startups and new ventures fail is because they can't get the capital they need to actually execute right. or they're totally dysfunctional. Right. And so, yeah, uh, that, that delusions of grandeur, it's interesting to me. So it, it, I did a lot of looking. So Arkansas has made significant improvement in the whole, just the, the startup ecosystem over the last 10 years or so. I mean, 15 years ago, there was nothing 10 years ago. There were things, and now it's a lot further. And yet, where we're at compared to Austin, Portland, uh, obviously, you know, Boston, Silicon Valley, I mean, just very different. And uh, I was talking to one of my buddies who is a VC out in uh, Silicon Valley, and he said, you know, really, the approach out here is I'm going to invest in 10 things. Eight of them are going to lose every dime we put into it. One of them will break even. And the 10th one will more than compensate for all the other nine. It goes, that's, that's the mindset. And when I come to Arkansas and meet with people, the level of, of traction that they wanted to see was so high that I felt like, 
yeah, but, but that's why I'm coming to you now and ready to give you, you know, 20% of my company right now is they go, oh, we like you. Oh, we like this idea. We, uh, yeah, I don't know. I want to see this level of execution. I'm good. I go, one example that I had learned from our, our pilot test was the feedback from our, from our shoppers were saying, this is really clunky here. This isn't at all good. The payment thing here doesn't work well. You know, whatever it was. And so then I'd go to the the potential investors and I'd say, okay, here's our test and here's what the driver did and here's what they did. And I'd walk them through all of it. And here's our feedback. We're closing the loop and here's what we need to go change. And since we need to go change these things, I've gone and done an RFP and I've gotten bids from in-state to Seattle, to the Philippines, to India. And I can show you the whole range of, of development and IT costs. And here's how we'd spend the money. You know, I'd lay it all out. Well, we want to see more traction. I go, yeah, but the problem is if I go get more traction, as you're saying it, I am pushing people to a bad user experience. Why do you want to do that? Like why, if they're, if they're telling us this is crappy, this is painful, there's friction here. Okay, well, go sign up another 10,000 people. That sounds like a terrible idea. Well, let's go take what we've learned and go do it right. And yet there's just a risk aversion, it seems like. That's what to, it sounds like. Uh, but again, you see a lot more willingness in other other markets, I think, to uh, take risk, to to invest. And so yeah. um, that's probably a little bit of a, a pain point for me having gone through it. Well, and it's, it's, it, it kind of goes back to um, – the, the terminology that people parrot because, you know, your MVP talked about all the time. And when I hear MVP, a lot of people, they, they, like a friend who I had on the podcast last week was talking about how, you know, he made his, his, his app and there were nine other competitors who had all had the same apps. Literally the only reason his was successful was because it had a more aesthetically pleasing, better mm -hmm. user interface yeah. than the other nine. And for many startup owners, that would be in contradiction to what the MVP is, which is, you know, it's, it's literally the yeah, minimum. Yeah, just get buy it out there. Yeah, just yeah. get it out there, right? Yeah. And, and even hearing your story, it, it kind of changes the, the framing of what MVP means to some people. Right. Yeah. I had had it. Again, I felt like it was beyond MVP. I mean, there was a web presence. I'd spent money on web development. I'd spent money on attorney's fees. So I actually had my, my wife is an attorney, quick aside. And so uh, trying to do a startup in a house where your, your spouse is an attorney and they spend all day, every day, 50 hours a week seeing how things go badly. There, there was a level of comfortability, let's say, where she had to have some certain legal things in place before I would go and you know, lose the house or something like that. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I'd spent money on web development, spent money on attorney's fees, spent money on insurance and getting a courier service. And like, I tried to check as many boxes. I'd had it wireframed. I'd run a pro forma. I had RFPs from around the world. I had clear costs. I had drivers and I had shopper, you know, purchasers. And it wasn't enough. And, and think of this. So my first exposure to this was uh, 2000. Again, November of 13. I started my consulting in October of 13. Now I'm getting prepped for a meeting. And I saw that Walmart was running a program called Walmart to go. This is late 2013. Amazon was running something called the Amazon Fresh. Uh, eBay had something called eBay Now. And Google had Google Shopping Express. eBay and Google were almost solely in the Bay Area. Walmart at that point had about six markets and uh, Amazon Fresh was in the Bay Area and maybe one or two markets. And I came out of that meeting with two major ahas. This is into 2013. Uh, I was also, by the way, right at that time, reading as much as I could about this company called Uber. Hmm. Who at 2013, I didn't know anything about. And now I'm going, oh, my goodness. Hmm. This, you know, you hear the, another term we hear parroted in, in startup is, is disruption, but oh you go gosh. that, yeah. and so as cliche as that has become in some things, yeah. you go, I can't think of a better disruptor than Uber, or Airbnb, something yeah, yeah. like that. Sure. So I came out of it, and I go, my goodness, here are the two ahas I had. The first is same day, last mile grocery delivery is going to be coming very soon. If Walmart, Amazon, Google, and eBay, who have massive data, massive research, massive supply chain, etc and know the pulse of what people are searching for online, but what people are asking for, like, this is coming. This is coming very soon. That was the first aha. The second was none of the models that I saw 
were valid. They, they, they're not going to work. I've worked with consumer packaged goods and retailers for 15, 20 years. And every one of them was investing in what I'd call heavy assets. So they'd have a warehouse to store the food. They'd have a fleet of vehicles. Those vehicles have to be filled with gas, have to have drivers, have to have insurance for it. There's spoilage. There's all this stuff. No way. The, the margins are already so compressed. You can't now add a gazillion dollars of startup costs and now go deliver a head of lettuce to somebody and make any money off it. Like, <laughs> it's not going to happen. Yeah. But the Uberization of everything, oh, my gosh, that opens the doors completely. And so what was so painful was to see this thing written on the wall as clear as day. This is coming. And to begin to try and go out there and develop this MVP to say, guys, this is coming. This is coming. Just please invest. Like, hey. And crickets. And, uh, you know, investors and guys going, ah, sounds like magic. You put it in your phone and an hour later, groceries show up at your door. I, I believe it can be done, but I I just don't know. And I go, ah, you know. And so on the one hand, I applaud the, the Warren Buffett mentality of if he can't explain it, he doesn't invest in it. And so I had a lot of guys who had been successful in business that would hear my pitch and they'd go, God, that sounds great, but I don't understand it in there for I'm not touching it. And so now years later, here we are in 2019 and my city has Instacart and Bite Squad and Chef Shuttle and, you know, a million last mile delivery. And you go, yeah, yep, yep, <laughs> there it is. So timing, timing's big too. And it, it feels like listening to your story that, that you know, that timing is the answer in, in, in both. It plays a major role in how you be successful. But it sounds like it was a major deterrent for why why car delivered didn't work out. Yeah. Right. And it's it's sometimes I talk to business owners who I was talking to a woman on on the topic of innovation and she said, What's you know, what are the things that are most needed for successful innovation? And I had said something like luck and timing. Mm -hmm. And she was like, Well, those aren't good answers yeah. because it's <laughs> They're not answers she wanted to hear. It's, but it was it's totally out of your control. That's right. And I was like, but but it's also, I mean, because let's think about it. You have so many major brands who I just assume smartest people in the room. Right. I mean, these companies are are bankrolling just phenomenal people, incredible strategic thinkers, and yet they get beat out by a dinky tiny company called Uber. How does that happen? And I th I think it's it's kind of what you mentioned. You you have this idea that was five, six years ago. And then literally just in the last, it feels like the last two years is when these things have really exploded sure. and grow. Yeah. I, I think timing is massive. There's a, uh, there's a Ted talk by gosh, it's Bill is his first name. I wish I, I don't know if it's Grossman. I can't remember. Do a Ted search for Ted talk, Bill and timing. So, he had worked for a VC group and he said, we did an internal study of the, you know, hundreds of companies that we had invested in to try and say, can we identify even from our own data set where success came from? Because obviously we want to replicate that and throw money towards things that work. He said, I used to think, or we used to think that the idea was it. If you have the idea, it's going to find its way to the market. Then we realized eh, that's a part, but it's not it. Then we thought it was access to capital, which you and I talked about a little bit, which is uh, huge. And yeah. yet yeah. there were he had numbers of things within their own portfolio where you go, we had a great idea and we were well funded and still failed. So then it became, oh, it's it's the it's the go to market approach. You have the the good idea, you got the funding, but you can mess up if you don't have a good go-to-market strategy. If you don't, you know, do this well and the, you know, the execution on it, then that's going to fall. And then they had a, a list of companies that met all those criteria and still fit. Okay. Oh, well then it became, no, it's the team. That's it. It's the team. You've got the idea, you got the funding, you got the right strategy, but if you don't have the team to execute it and the right people in place, back to the, the Jim Collins, get the right people on the bus and the wrong ones off. Anyway, long and short, the fifth factor that they found to be bigger than all of them was timing. And he gave example after example, not just of their companies, but things like, like YouTube. He gave an example of how there were predecessors to YouTube 
but there was a codex issue in just how browsers, browsers worked and this and that, yeah. and others had launched, but there was such delay, there wasn't clarity, there was latency, and then once the codex issue got solved by a different company solving a different thing, and this YouTube group launched, boom, took fire. They didn't, They weren't first with the idea, they weren't better funded than the other groups, they weren't all that, but the timing... And so that, for me, at least, as I look at it, as I go, yeah, so now I see a ton of groups doing it, I, and, and there's something that is both extremely validating. It go, hey, honey, I was, I was right. See, it was a good idea. And at the same time, incredibly painful to be like, gosh, should I have just buckled down and yeah. gutted it out for another year? That Again, did I, you know, the story of the guy who went to 50 VCs and the 51st one funded, yeah. like, did I stop too early? Did I do this? And just... Was the public not ready for it? You know, whatever it is. And I just go, man, uh, timing is massive. So here's what I'm hearing is uh, starting a business is hard. <laughs> <laughs> turns out, turns out. So, so if, we can, if we can park there for a second, you know, what, when was the moment that you said, um, no, I, I think I'm done. I think I'm done and I think I want to do something else. And, yeah. yeah. You know, and I feel like I've had those moments for my own business of like, sure of, you know, you have a down day or you have a meeting that didn't go the way you wanted it to, right. or maybe you have a client who you thought it was going to go one way and it went a totally different way. And it's like, yeah, I think I'm done, but you're not really done. You're kind of just down on yourself. But, right. but then there's a moment that happens where it's like, no, I, I think I really am done. Yeah. What, what, what was that moment for you? I had about three. I had a, that there were progressively, you know, you can hear the, the hammer hit the nail, hit the nail at it. You know, close that coffin shut, right? So the first was, um, so uh, my, our third child was born in October of 2014. So keep in mind at this point, I started my consulting in October of 13. And now a month later, I start working on cart delivered as well. Yep. So I'm doing a startup in terms of putting myself out there as a consultant. That's paying bills. And now I'm trying to do this quasi startup on the side. Then by a year later, our third child is born. <gasps> okay, and that's busy. And now 2015, when I'm actually rolling out the pilot and doing all that, I'm busier. I've got a third kid. My wife's working full time. I'm working full time. We're, we're, we're busy. I've now taken in less consulting work because I'm trying to also stand up this startup. So financially, I'm under more duress. And then I'm spending money on web development, on attorney's fees, on insurance. So I'm expending money. I'm taking in less business of my own. I've got a newborn at home who's not sleeping through the night, plus my other two kids that are busy. And then you start getting punched in the face by life. So for me, it was uh, April, May. I tore my MCL playing in a volleyball tournament. And so now it's, oh, well, I wasn't planning on paying for that x-ray. And then paying for that MRI and then months of uh, rehab. Okay, so I wasn't planning on that. And then, oh, doctor bills for the, the newborn that were higher than expected. And then August of 2015, we had three air conditioning units go out in a 10-day period. It was like, all right, your car AC is out. There's 500 bucks. All right, your rental property had a thing. Okay, and then now your big one's at home. So, you know, 10 grand later on that, and you're sitting in the heat and swaller of a Little Rock summer in August, and you're out of money, and you've spent your stuff on this, and the VCs aren't yet sold on it, and your wife looks at you, and you haven't taken on more funding, and you've got a less than one-year-old, and it's like, so I need to do some things to bring in some income right now, right? So I hadn't yet killed it, but boy, those were two big huh. nails. So I get back to consulting. It takes me about six weeks to double down on consulting, and now I'm back up to 40 hours a week of committed work. I've got money coming in. So in my mind, all I've done is set it on the back burner. It's still on simmer. All it's going to be is wait till I get that right meeting with the right group, and it's going to hit. And I work those committed hours from call it November of 15 through early 16. Again, everything's still in place. So all the legals paid for the, this, the, that I've got a CTO ready to come on board. If we get funding, I've got dev shops that are ready to go. I've got my pro forma in place. Like all the legwork had been done and I'd taken a couple of beatings and a couple of blows, but now I've got income coming in. So it's just going to be a matter of getting in front of the right person. So I keep doing that. I keep doing that, and then I start getting full-time job offers. And the, that lure of, hey, 
we like your consulting work. Have you, why, don't you, why don't you come work for us? Hey, hey, what? And I had this bizarre stretch from February through March where I got six job offers in six weeks and I hadn't sent off a single resume. Yeah. I hadn't applied for anything and people were coming to me and the battle of the last year and a half or two and the stress at home. And it was like, I think, I think I'll take one of those nice jobs. And in my <laughs> mind, it was still, I've still got this thing and maybe it'll work. And I just eventually, you know, a couple months into working another job for another person again, I said, this is done. And now what I do is I get calls. I mean, even in the last, I'd say three, four weeks, I've met with probably three different groups who have some last mile delivery service and people will put me in touch with them and, hey, can you, oh, sure, I'll share my database. I'll show you my, uh, here are the markets we're going to go to next if you care to see my pro forma and our financials, you know, like, cause I want to see this succeed and I want to see Arkansas companies do well, but there's a pain in it of going. Yeah. That was the nail was early 16 of just going, resigning myself a little bit to just going, this is, this is my life right now. And I would rather prioritize my family than chase after this thing that I still think is very viable, but the, the cost day to day at, at home and on health and whatnot, not, not worth it. And so it was again, painful to lay down, but it was also clear to me that, Hey, mm. so anyway, that, that was um, my, you know, and it, it just, it continues to, um, sometimes I talk to, you know, we have the U of A here and, uh, there's, there's an entrepreneurship office and not through the U of A, but sometimes I talk to students who are going into college and they say, so I'll just to quote one that I talked to last week, he said, hey, I'm 18. I want to major in entrepreneurship. Is this a good idea? And I said, well, why do you want to major in entrepreneurship? And he said, well, I love the idea of being my own boss and waking up whenever I want. And, you know, it's like sure. it's like a young guy's dream, love I guess. Sure. You know, I could stay up and play video games as late as I want. And you're just like, what do you think this is, man? Because it's like, it's like the hardest thing. You, know, you have things that you're like, oh, yeah, that was hard. And then you actually get into entrepreneurship and it's like, Wow, this is a gut check, right? Like, wow, this is a challenge. Absolutely. It, that that interview with your, your this eighteen year old guy you talked about reminds me of one of my favorite uh, Michael Scott moments on uh, on <laughs> The Office, uh, where my wife and I look at each other and quote this to each other and laugh about it regularly. Which is, he's at this career fair trying to get high schoolers interested in Dunder Mifflin paper. <laughs> yeah. And you know, there's the Army Navy recruiter over there, and there's the this guy and that guy. And he, Michael is so distraught that nobody's interested to come and work for his paper company. And, and, you know, he's got such a, so much of his identity tied up in it, but his, his grab, grabs the microphone and tries to do a real zinger to the whole crowd of students and whatever. And, and his, but what it came up with was, you know, rather than work for any of these, I, I'd rather, live on a beach off the inheritance of some rich uncle and, and whatever, then go to work for any of these. And you go, yeah, of course <laughs> anybody would. Right. And so this idea of just going to sleep in, play video games, golf when I want, do whatever. I mean, that's why I want to be an entrepreneur. And you just go, who wouldn't want that? But that's, that's not the game. Well, it's not the deal. It goes back to what I was saying about there's, there's this terminology that gets parroted in this sort of like, this cliche that unless you're really in it, you you can get sold by it. And it's people who say, you know, I man, I want to, I'm growing up and I'm about to be a man or a or a woman. And I I have just always envisioned myself being an entrepreneur, like like that title means something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, because it doesn't yeah. it doesn't really mean anything other than just like this sort of like this beach lifestyle right. of I do what I want. Right. I don't like being told what to do. And it, it <laughs> honestly, it sounds very um it, it sounds very immature, right? You know, it right. sounds it sounds not rooted in reality, right? What excites me is when you hear the young people that m maybe some of the language is the same, but it's a desire to create and build something mm. that I can get behind, and I yeah. can go build something great, whether that's a coffee shop or a hair salon or a mechanic or a, somebody who wants to hang drywall, but they want to build something. They want to. They've got vision for working hard. And creating something, I go, oh, love it. Love it. Let's, you know, what can I do to help you? Who can I put you in touch with, you know? And, and I think that is maybe the, 
the shift is to get people to think again beyond the lifestyle, beyond what you're envisioning is is sexy and fun, into realizing no, it's going to take a, a ton of work and be really hard. But if your desire is to create and build, uh, and you understand that unless you do it well, no one's going to pay for it. Mm. Uh, you know that's that's a, again the beauty. I'm a big free market guy. Free enterprise is if you create something people like, mm-hmm. they they will pay for it. But if you put out a crappy product. Don't kid yourself. Like, no, you're not going to survive. There's not going to, you're not going to mm-hmm. make it. Um, well, I, I think people struggle with that in that we have a, a culture of people who just, just, re- it feels like rejection is harder than ever. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to internalize being disliked. I mean, we live in a Facebook, Instagram right. era, right? And so I think what's challenging is sometimes going back to simplicity versus complexity. Right. Is someone will come to you and say, Hey, I have this product and no one's buying it. Is it is it this reason, this reason, this reason, or this reason? And it's like it it's not any of those reasons. People just don't, they don't just be just keep right. it simple. They just do not right. want what you have. Right. Which right. is hard to it's hard to, That's I guess, right. receive that sometimes. Yeah. All right. So I want to ask you a question because this this is hitting on something that uh, you, you'll quickly see the two schools of thought. And and I honestly, I vacillate between these. So I'd love your insight on this. So the, the first school is the follow your dreams, hmm. right? Uh, you know, the, the, the adage that do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life, right? Even if you're putting in 60, 70 hour weeks, if it's what you love and you're passionate about, then it doesn't feel like work. It's, you know, so you hear that. And again, there is a truth to that. I also have a lot of struggles with it. The other side of the argument, I heard, uh, I think Mike Rowe from uh, Dirty Jobs articulated this brilliantly. And I think he's got to go look it up, like a five minute video on uh, don't follow your passion, follow your opportunity. And here's how he equated it. He basically said, mm. Watch one season of American Idol and you realize following your passion is not the answer, right? Because you have. Thousands of people every year go and try out for American Idol. Only a small portion of them make it. But even then, you get to see a little glimpse and a window into people failing in front of these world-renowned musicians. And they get up and they think, well, my mom's told me I'm a great singer. All my friends think I'm great. And you're you're not. <laughs> you're really not. And they're crushed. And so, as you said, that rejection is so hard, Right. Because they've been told they're great and you're you're really not. And so that's following your passion to a detriment. Yeah. Mike Rowe says, hey, I spent years doing this dirty jobs. Nobody's passionate about septic tanks. Hmm. But I tell you what, I met this guy and he worked really hard and he had integrity and he developed a business model. And from a worldly standpoint, he's wildly successful. And has all that he you know wants, but nobody's passionate about pig farming and and septic tanks and cleaning gutters and whatever. But if you follow your opportunity, you'll find there's a lot. And I, and so I see valid points in both. Mm. I yes, of course, my heart leans towards going. Yes, I want to sing. I want you know whatever it is that you want to do. Of course, I want to chase after that. And then there's the pragmatic side of me too that goes. And part of, again, why in 2016, I, I tucked my tail a little bit between my legs and said, well, practically, I'm getting job offers out the wazoo and they're good and they'll be good for my family and they'll provide. And yeah, yeah, I can do that. So I'd be curious, what, what are some of your thoughts? Because especially with your background and your coaching, yeah. how do you feel that of not wanting to squash somebody's dreams, not wanting to crush them yeah. <laughs> and yet at the same time seeing a valid thing over here but yeah. of course if you could do what you love and be paid for it great but those don't always go hand in hand so i, I think that i i i have a few principles that i try to live by and, and one of them has always been if i have an opportunity to speak into someone's life and influence them i want to lead them to success in whatever form that is even if it's a harsh truth so I, it makes me think of when i was a teacher when I was a teacher, I had this student who he was, uh, this guy would eat Cheetos in class. He just was not, he was very lazy, just always snacking on something and g- really great kid. But I remember, you know, this is like the classic asking the student, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, this kid played on the JV team and he was a terrible basketball player. <laughs> I mean, horrendous. And I remember I asked him one day in class, I said, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he says, man, I want to play in the NBA. 
And I said, you need to find a new dream. And he was stunned. And he said, how can you tell me that? You're my, you're, you're supposed my to, teacher. You're, you're supposed to tell me. I'm, and he was, I mean, he was laughing, but he was like, right. you know, this, this kid wasn't like, please don't send me an email. This, this kid was not like in tears or anything. He right. was laughing and he was like, you're supposed to tell me I can follow my dreams. And I go, he, he, actually, what he said was, he goes, you're supposed to tell me I can do anything. And I go, you can, just not that. Just not that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Only because I had seen him play. And so it felt like right. the, Honestly, for me, it was like a moral thing of it feels like stewarding you well is being I care enough about you to be honest with you, right? And so whenever I I started my coaching business, I started to look at what are people doing because I knew I needed to be on social media. I knew I needed to be on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn mm-hmm. as the big three in my mind. Mm-hmm. And and LinkedIn, I was slow to get on. Uh but definitely Facebook and Instagram I was on immediately. Well, so I was looking and seeing what are other people doing? And everyone was putting out this very motivational, follow your dreams kind of rhetoric. And I don't have any problem with that rhetoric in the sense of uh, I have friends who are in not necessarily dead end jobs. There's a lot of opportunities there, but they're so unfulfilled mm-hmm. and unhappy. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're friends of mine and I feel for them. Mm-hmm. I empathize with them. I think, man, life is so short. If you're miserable, right. it's, it, I, I get it. Right. So I, I understand where that comes from. On the flip side, and, and I don't want to sound cynical, but I call it entrepreneurship pornography. Mm. And it's this whole mentality of follow your dreams and follow your passion. And, and I think, I think that we all are, should be held. I mean, At the end of my life, I'm going to be held accountable to the people that I've influenced. And if I just parrot entrepreneurship pornography and do, you know, do what's your passion about, do, I I could lead someone in a path that is not only in their best interests, but could be detrimental. It could be totally crushing financially for them because no one had the heart to tell them, hey, you're awesome and I love you, but don't do that. But don't do this. Yeah. Right. So. So I, I think there is a balance to it. I think you, I think you can mutually have it. I, I definitely find that fall on the pragmatic side. When I talk to a new entrepreneur and they ask, what should I do? Like, what's the what? I tell them the mutually both, both hands yeah. answer. I yeah. say, find the thing that you're passionate about, that you enjoy doing, but also that you are skilled at and yes. that you have something of value to offer. That's right. You need to have both. That's right. I, this comes back, we talked earlier about uh, assessment and the, the importance of leadership being able to assess their people and then put them into positive feedback loops, right? So this totally hits on that for me. I heard a pastor say it one time, he was talking about working with young church planters. And one of the biggest things that he saw that churches failed at was assessing people well. Hey, they're young. Oh, they're a good worship leader. They're a good this or yeah. Well, okay. You likened it to a baseball camp, right? He goes, you know, hey, what do you want to do? Oh, I, I'm a pitcher. Oh, okay, great. And we show you how to stretch out your arm. We show you, okay, this is a fastball, this is a curveball, here's a knuckleball, and you take them through that, and then you do strength training, and then you do this, and here's how to keep it limber, and you don't want Tommy John surgery, so you got to, you know, walk them through all that. And after, you know, six weeks, six months. They're throwing a 75 mile an hour fastball. You go, you're not a pitcher. I'm okay. guessing that's slow. I don't, I don't oh, yeah. watch baseball. <laughs> I don't watch baseball. So. For, a, for a fastball, yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so he needs to go with this level of, you can have all the tools. You know how to stretch it out. You know it. But if you're a 75 mile an hour fastball, buddy, you're not going not gonna to cut it. Right. And so I think what you did as a coach, even to that, that student, is that missing piece that too often our society and our culture what was the the movie waiting for superman documentary years yeah, ago yeah. i loved part of the intro was we're falling behind in math we're falling behind in science we're doing this and that but the one area that united states youth lead the entire world in it's is confidence, confidence. Yeah. <laughs> and you go yeah. oh and it, there's a painfulness right there's a part of me that has to own that and go yeah mm. i i'm th- i'm that too and yet at the same time go we got to wake up and we need our next generation to wake up sooner lest they all think because there is such a thing now as being a professional gamer there is mm-hmm. such a thing as yeah. being a, a professional drone racer right but not not for most people and so don't yeah. don't think that this no, is the, the likely man i love what you said too because it's it's and here's the deal i, I don't have I, I for me it's exciting to see new niches pop up and new things that you would have never thought, like professional gaming. Yes, right. Like, like what? 
You know, it was on ES- it was on the ESPN. Yes. You know, the Ocho, like, I think. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Like, it, well, so I don't have any. I think that's phenomenal to see how industries grow and develop. It's just fascinating. It's right. awesome. I think what's tough is you you have to understand how susceptible a young kid is right. to. They're 14 years old. They love Fortnite, and it's like, man, when I grow up, I want to be a professional gamer. And it's like, it's like, man, you gotta. And I, I wouldn't have a problem if you did, but dude, come on. Right. There's, there, there have to be other options right. here. And it kind of makes me think of, you know, it feels like we just sometimes we're so resistant to give people the honest truth. Mm-hmm. And it makes me think of, I was actually going back to like a, a business example. I was talking to a guy who had an employee who was really struggling. And I said, man, you got to tell him, like, you got to talk to him. And he's like, okay, I'll talk to him. And so we meet the next week and I say, so how how the conversation go? Yeah. <laughs> and he goes, oh, I think it went good. I think he's got, I think he got the answer. And I said, well, so you told him what he was doing wrong, right? And he was like, well, no. I mean, I, I made up some other things that were kind of like subtle as to why. And I was like, man, you, you, you owe it to the person. Right. Right. And it's it, an expression I've always loved is correction is not rejection. Hmm. Yeah. And, and so it, it's, we have to get out of the mindset of if I correct you or critique right. you, right. I'm not calling you a horrible person or dehumanizing you right. or, you know, you're a total loser. Right. It's, it's, we have to have a culture where I care enough to let you know what That's I think. Right. And then it's up to you to, to take that feedback or not. That's right. It, the, the Bible talks about uh, that God disciplines us as sons and that we should recognize that, that discipline is a good thing. The father, if, if you're not disciplining your son, I've got, Three kids, and if little guy's running out by the road, and I'm like, eh, he'll learn. <laughs> no, 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 he, yeah. Like that's a lesson he can't learn because yeah. he's done. You run out in that street, right? So if I don't discipline him, I'm not being loving at all. That's not caring for him. Yeah. So discipline, I like that though. That correction is not rejection, and obviously we grow in our ability to do it in love, do it in a careful mm-hmm. way, not just bang somebody over the head with the reality of, well, you suck at doing this. Well, that, yeah, that's harsh, yeah. but, uh, but it's important to, well, to give. It, it makes, I had a boss once who was a, I'd call him a hard boss in that he could be abrasive and was really tough to work for in some sense, but is the boss I'm most grateful for because mm-hmm. he's, he's the one who's developed me the most professionally. But I remember everyone was anxious because he was so good at picking up on mm. mistakes that people would make. And he was very candid about, here's how you blew it. Like he would tell it to your face. And, and there would sometimes be wounds there of, yeah. you know, uh, now I'm in tears because of how you communicated this to me. Wow. But beyond his delivery, I remember people were so wary of these conversations with him that they would try to avoid getting caught per se. <laughs> Like, I don't want you to That's catch great. me doing something That's wrong right. or making a mistake. And there's a great lesson there on your style and like, how do you make it easy to fail? And, right. but I remember something he said was, uh, that kind of changed my framing of my perspective was he said, the, the reason I'm so direct on mistakes is because I care so much about your ability to exceed. Yeah. And so rather than thinking, I hope you never catch me, right. I hope you change your thinking and think of it as I, I, I want to be caught every time per se. That's and, and, great. and maybe that phrasing is off because I don't want, I don't ever think employees should think of it in terms of like being caught or not caught, sure. but the mentality of, I want people to point out my flaws. I want to be, and actually it makes me think of, uh, you know, some people say that, but they don't really mean that. And so I had one guy who he asked for some feedback, but I knew he didn't really want feedback. <laughs> you gave it to him and they're like, what was that for? <laughs> well, I remember, but so I asked him, I said, he, he asked for feedback and I said, do you want me to say something encouraging or do you want me to tell you what I really think? And he paused and he said, I want to know what you really think. <laughs> did you? Cause it, cause and did you follow through? I did. Okay. Yeah. But, but again, the way I operate is typically, you know, if there's a tear there, here or there, That's right. you know, I, it's so. Charles Barkley said at this one time, I remember thinking, and I mean, I've loved him as a basketball player and hear him as a commentator, but it cracked me up. I was like, that was so profound, Charles. He said, a good coach needs to know which guys on the team need a pat on the back every five minutes and which guys need a kick in the butt every five minutes. He says, I needed a kick in the butt. Yeah. And if you'd just been the, oh, hey, guy, hey, buddy, hey, you know, you're doing great. He said, 
that didn't motivate me at all. I would have slacked off and done whatever. But if you're constantly kicking the guy in the butt and coming down on the guy who needs that pat on the back, you lose him, you crush mm. him. And so I think there is that not only did that one boss you had give you that good feedback and he says, because I care so much, but really you do need to understand the dynamics of your people and where they're at because the the method with which you deliver that is huge. Mm. I, we use it again, something my wife and I joke around a lot about with things is this term, the compliment sandwich, which is, you know, if you've got something difficult to deliver, man, sandwich that thing in a couple of compliments like, hey, Blake, man, love your podcast. Blah, blah, blah. You know, there's this <laughs> You're a thing huge failure. that you got, uh, you know, <laughs> you got to do. And then you come right back over the yeah. top with, right? Yeah. Like, there's just understanding how we as people, uh, you know, receive harsh or, or, or any criticism, whether harsh or not. And so I think that is something to be aware of is important. Critical feedback is important, but even the manner in which we deliver it. Gosh, I have crushed my kids before in ways that, well, I think I'm being helpful. I mm. think this is, this is an important school project worth X percent of your grade. I thought I was being helpful, but boy, the way I did it, they did not come away feeling loved and supported by dad, right? And so it's like, oh, that hurts. Mm. I need to get better at how I'm going to deliver that message. They need, they do need the message. You're, you're not making the NBA, mm. buddy. But I can say that in such a way, hopefully, that encourages them in in something. So. Well, it makes me think of um, the journey of a leader. And like you talk about the difference between a good coach, you know, the pat on the back versus the kick in the rear. And I think, I think sometimes I run into leaders who they want to get better at having direct conversations with people, but they're worried about the awkwardness. Mm -hmm. Like you talked about giving feedback to your kids and knowing that you wound, like there was a, there was a pain yeah. that was created there. And I think people are very wary of that direct conversation because they don't want to be the awkward, awful boss. And they, they, but by the same token, it's like a muscle you never use. If you, if you don't get out there and actually work it and have those hard conversations, you'll never find that balance mm -hmm. between how do I deliver this honest feedback in a way that isn't awkward right. and embarrassing and, right. you know, blaming or however way that would come across. Yeah. So okay. let me, let me go back to a couple more things I want to, I want to touch on before we wrap up. Um, going back to, and this is, I think this, I don't know if this is going to be a challenging question to answer or if you, if you have the right answer for it, but the, you decided you going back to cart delivered you decided, you know what, I'm going to, you know, pick up, pick up this, you know, close down basically and do this other right. job and maybe I'll come back to it. And you, and you never did. Right. Do you ever, when you think back to that moment, do you ever, maybe regret's too strong of a word, but, but seeing today no, that's fair. <laughs> as a single tear comes down your face. And I know you said already that there's some validation, but, but, you know, seeing how successful the final mile delivery service is today right and you know we talked a lot about timing sure is there anything you would have done different i don't think there were things i would have done different given the givens of my circumstance at that time so take for example um one of the other things that sometimes you know if you ever watch shark tank or again my legitimate experience meeting with potential angel investors or funds uh, was they wanted to know what level of skin in the game you had, right? If you're saying, hey, I need $10 million to go do this, and I've, I've put 300 of my own into it, they go, yeah, let's, let's see some more effort on your part, right? Um, I was in a place where I had put money into it. Again, like I said, mostly around web development, time, opportunity cost of not pursuing my other consulting gigs, attorney's fees, uh, insurance, I'd run a pilot. I'd done some things. And when I kind of got met with the, we, we're not there yet. We want to, you know, why don't you go? Because I had the option. I hadn't done the round of what they call friends, family, and fools, right? Anybody who will give you money. Hmm. Can I hit up my friends? Can I go have that awkward conversation at Thanksgiving meal and ask Uncle Larry for, some, you know, whatever. I hadn't done that route. And, and that is one thing that I think back on because I go, I could have bought some time. Hmm. I had enough people and I have enough rapport with enough people that I could have. But there was a part of me that said, no, I want to do it right. And I don't think you should have to do. My my thought was this. What if I just go out and build an, an MVP app 
and you can actually put it in somebody's hand and I've smoothed out the user experience and the payments smooth. And, you know, and we integrate these things and maybe I get 60 grand from friends, family and fools. Like I could have done that. My issue was sitting on the side of it of going, yeah, but to do it right on the front end isn't all that much. And rather than scrap it and now go build the real version, why not just let's do it right from the get-go? And we had enough other examples that were out there. So that is one that I look back. Would I have changed that? I might have. I might have tried to do that to give myself, say, an 18-month runway to say, yeah, I can make a go of this. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it makes me think of, you know, you hear the concept fail fail fast. Yeah. I think the other side of it is fail cheaply. <laughs> and And the reason you fail cheaply is if you have a – limited pool of funds, you want to stretch that out. That's right. And I, I think, and I've made this mistake of a lot of times we treat uh, our startup, our gig, whatever side hustle we're developing as almost like, like a, um, a bank account that develops interest. Where like, if I put money into it, mm -hmm. that will force the same <laughs> amount of money, if not more to come right. out of it. Right. And sometimes it feels like, uh, it feels like there is such a, um, timing element that we talked about that if you can just survive yeah, to right. a certain point right. as you're building that momentum, then maybe it clicks. Yeah. I don't know. I think another, I think that is valid. I also say, speak to another aspect of timing. There is the timing of the market and then there's a timing as an individual. And so when we think back and you're asking me, would I've done something different? Something that's painful to admit, but is to look at it and go, huh, we're only a couple of years into my wife's new job. So she's she's gone back to law school. She's got a brand new career. We're now figuring out what does that look like to have a dual income, but dual, you know, time is tough. And we've got two kids and soccer and band and all these things. And now we just had a third little guy. Probably wasn't great timing for me to go. <laughs> and by the way, babe, yeah. I'm going to try this thing. My difficulty was I saw the moment. Right. This window won't be. And again, five years later. Right. It's too late The today. market, right. Like yeah. I go. So I, there was a validation of going. There is timing is important. And right now it is the Wild West. And and then I know consolidation is going to happen. And sure enough, you know, like six months ago, eight months ago, you know, Target bought shipped for $500 million. And again, felt this validation. And at the same time, it was, oh, oh, <laughs> gosh. Yeah. You know, I go. They were out of Alabama, not not Silicon Valley. Out of Alabama. When did they start? Oh, 2014. Oh, great. And they sold the Target. I go, we had the retailer of the whole world in my backyard who I'd right. worked with for years. And was right. like, like, and I was a supply chain major. And so right. logistics, this is like, this is my thing. There is this window. And yet I didn't probably rightly account the cost to my family, hmm. the timing with where I was at that, yeah, maybe I would have just gone, man, that's. It's kind of selfish right now. Maybe, maybe mm. focus. And again, eventually I got there with the, the AC units going out and the torn MCL and the baby not sleeping. And eventually it's like, yeah, I think it's time to take that mm. full-time job. But there's a pain in that too of just recognizing where are you at? Where's your stage of life? If you're, if you're 18 to 25 and single and willing to eat ramen noodles and sleep on a couch with a couple other dudes, Go for it, man. Absolutely. More to power to you. If you're in your first two years of marriage, mm. slow down. Mm -hmm. Doesn't say stop. Don't say don't pursue it at all, but be careful. If you've just had a newborn, if you're in a new city, are your parents failing in health and they need more? Like whatever it is, like just recognize your stage of life and go back to that. It's always going to be more expensive. It's always going to take longer. And once you've factored that in, are you still comfortable? sticking your neck yeah. out and taking that risk. Yeah. And, and I, I think there's a great, um, lesson in your story in that sometimes on the other, on the other end of it, other than people who are starting people who are thinking, I talk to people occasionally who their story is, Hey, I've been doing this for this many years. I'm burnt out, unhappy, but it feels like such an ego blow. It feels so shameful to go back to, right go back to a totally. career, job, whatever, what, what encouragement or what insight do you have on that? Well, it's kind of both. So one is it has been really painful several times I've gone back. So I'll give you an example. It's just you're back to the bureaucracy that was some of the onus for why I wanted to leave. Uh, I was at a company, a government role for a, for a year uh, that was 
day one. Now, keep in mind, this is after having been my own guy and that whole thing. Yeah, I was calling the shots. I may have lowered my income some, but I I could be there for all the kids' games and I could you know, do whatever. And now I go back and I'm doing a state job. And day one, I'm filling out the paperwork for, um, you know, yeah, you know, are you legal to work in the U.S. and this and that and the other and just doing all the paperwork yeah. we always do. And I get this one PDF. It was a uh, 14 page PDF. The first two pages were what I had to complete. And the next 12 pages were instructions on how to complete the two pages. I said, oh, crap. <laughs> what have I got I'm back myself? <laughs> I'm back in and the bureaucracy. So, A, yes, it's very real and very hard. The other side is back to the pragmatic side is I go, it's a means to an end. Blake, turns out I'm not independently wealthy. And uh, <laughs> as such, and with three kids and a mortgage in life, you know what? It's okay. I, I like going out to Chili's or Outback Steakhouse every now and then. You got to have a higher standard than right? Chili's. <laughs> <laughs> you take, take what you like. I'm saying, <laughs> yeah, taking a couple of vacations a year. Yeah. Have a little extra income to go out to eat. Yeah. These are worthwhile things that I go, hey, and, and who's to say in X number of years when the kids are out of high school and whatever, like, yeah, I may do that again. Or that well-funded startup over there that can actually – pay me, but I can still be on the ground floor or help build something or create. Absolutely. I'm still very interested in that. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's just trade-offs. And I think that's it is trying to be uh, self-aware on the same page with your spouse, on the same page with your kids, and then just understanding that it's trade-offs and that's okay. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I think I've come to more peace with just, man, I remember my wife, when she was going back to law school, she'd been valedictorian in her high school, really bright, been accepted to study abroad, all these things. But later, when she was going back to law school and with two kids and a husband who worked and whatever else, she had to know up front, I don't have the time as that 22-year-old who's just out of undergrad to stay at the library at one, till 1 p.m. or 1 a.m. every morning and do this and do that. I've got I've got a family. I've got to do all this. And there was a painful self-awareness of going, oh, I could be head of the class, mm. but given my givens in life, I, I can't do that. And so I think I try and learn from that and say, man, yeah, what are the things that are non-negotiable? What do you want out of life? What are your goals? What are your family's goals? And then uh, what can you be now at peace with at the end of the night and lay your head on the pillow and feel good about? Mm. Um, so what are you working on now? Good question. So I've I've done a number of things over, over the last few years where I've taken a couple of interim roles uh, where it made sense with a client that I've consulted for. And then they said, hey, can you help us do these specific things for a year? Yeah, great. Go check that box. And then every time I finish up one of those roles, we come back to my wife and I going, what do we want out of life? What do we want out of this, out of this next season? So right now where I'm at is I've wrapped up uh, one engagement about two months ago and we're back to going, okay. So I'm dialing back up my consulting work with Symbian Product Solutions, where we do everything from uh, business strategy to development and sales, marketing, supply chain consulting, a lot of different things. But we also place people in roles, right? So if somebody, I'm not a headhunter agency, but if somebody came to me and said, hey, I'm trying to get on, here's my skill set. I go, great, let me try and plug you in. Uh, and the other is uh, brokering items, right? So in the past, people would say, hey, I want to get this item into retail. And I totally. go, great. Yeah. Here's five brokers I know. Yeah. from, and, and I'd pass them on to then going, you know what? I've worked in this space for forever. Uh, I can help with that, right? And so um, that's that's kind of what we focus on. And uh, and then and then still entertaining, you know, potential things that, oh, there's that startup that's got some things and they need some counsel oh, okay maybe this could go somewhere more or oh here's that full-time role that would be a significant bump in pay there you go yeah for the right thing i i can be bought <laughs> so th that's kind of where my I'm standards at, right? only go so that's far. right that's right <laughs> Well, uh, man, I loved having you on the episode today. Thanks so I, much. I, it was so easy to talk to you, and I, I feel like I have a total man crush on you. I mean, <laughs> really hey. easy to talk to you, man. And I, I, I would be surprised if we didn't have another episode down the down the road because uh, I love your perspective on entrepreneurship and especially just like talking through innovation in the startup world. I think you have a lot to offer. Uh, I think our listeners are going to find it. Even people who 
aren't in this world at all are going to find it really interesting and engaging on, you know, that's what that world looks like. Sure. Um, would you want people to be able to reach out to you? To sure. be able to feel free. Uh, you can reach me. My my address is joshua.airs, A-Y-R-E-S, at symbiantps.com. P.S. for product solutions. And symbiant is S-Y-M-B-I-E-N-T. PS.com. This is, by the way, a learning for you entrepreneurs out there. When you go and form a company and you decide to call it Symbiant Product Solutions, come up with an easier email address. For people. So uh, there, there's a learning, a little nugget for you right there. But yeah, feel free to reach out to me, connect with me on LinkedIn uh, uh, or other platforms, Twitter, Instagram, etc. Yeah. Well, thank you all for listening. I'm excited for this episode. And thanks for uh, bearing through the ambient noise of Puritan Coffee House. If you're in the the Northwest Arkansas area, definitely stop by and grab a cup of coffee. As always, if you enjoyed the episode, please leave me some feedback in the comment section or email me, Blake, at goodadvicecoaching.com. And yeah, that does it for today. Uh, We'll catch you all later. See you next week.